sing. Who win the sing? Go marching in. Go marching in. Who's going to play on the day when the things go marching in? Well, let me I'll explain that now. Welcome to a new edition of the Neon Jazz Interview Series with legendary jazz historian, reviewer, and author, Scott Yanow. You've probably seen his name all over the place when it comes to jazz. He's originally from New York City. He grew up in L.A., and he got hooked first after he heard the Dixieland and the Danny Kaye movie, The Five Pennies. His first record was the very best of Al Hurt and Pete Fountain, and from there he moved on into the real stuff with Charlie Parker and John Coltrane. He has written for Downbeat, Jazz Is, the Los Angeles jazz scene, the Jazz Rag, and the Jazz Inside, and he's been on over 750 liner notes, hundreds of press biographies and press releases, and he's released a lot of books. His name and words screams jazz every time you see it, and he has plenty of tales to tell, and they were told. So please dig this interview with Neon Jazz, my friends. Hey, thanks for taking some time to talk with me today. I appreciate it. Oh, sure. Let me start off here and ask you, what has been going on lately? Well, you know, I write for five magazines, so I'm always doing that and doing a lot of line in it. And uh, just got back from the Monterey Jazz Festival. And, you know, just just keeping busy. I'm thinking of different ideas for another book. Uh, let me go back to the beginning of your lineage here and ask you, you were born in New York and raised in L.A. Talk to me about how your childhood kind of cultivated this love of music and jazz for you? Well, actually, I'm the only person in my family that was at all interested in jazz, and I just kind of discovered it myself. What what happened is, right about the time I was 16, I saw in the Los Angeles Times, just looking in the, looking to see what was going on, that there was a radio show that called Strictly from Dixie that was on from... 5 to 6 p.m. Monday through Friday on, on one station, which is something I couldn't imagine now, you know, just having having a, a Dixieland show on, you know, five hours a week. But, uh, <laughs> you know, but I, looked, I, you know, I noticed that and I thought, oh, this is really happy music. Maybe I'll, I'll check it out. So I started listening to it and loved it immediately, and that's really how I got started. And then uh, a few months later, I discovered Chuck Cecil's swinging years, so then I got into the swing era. And when I... Went to college the following year. I had about oh about twenty five records in my collection, and people say, "Oh, what a huge collection!" And, and they were actually, uh, you know, being quite sincere in saying that. And and they looked through it, and Dukes of Dixieland, Pete Fountain, and Benny Goodman, and you know, thought I was crazy. So, uh, <laughs> you know, because they were all listening to Grand Funk and Led Zeppelin and whatever was around at that time. So, uh, after talking with some other musicians. Some musicians, I, you know, heard the names Charlie Parker and Dizzy Gillespie, and heard heard of some of the bebop players. So, I went to a used record store, and for two dollars, actually a dollar ninety nine, I bought a Charlie Parker record because, among other songs I'd never heard of, like Grooving High and Night in Tunisia, it had him playing White Christmas. I said, I've heard of that song. Yeah. So, because it was a broadcast, so I listened to that and. Uh, couldn't really get into it at first, but I listened to it two or three times a day, and by the end of the week, I was into it. And it, the, the floodgates went open, and within a few months, I was listening not only to Freddie Hubbard and Buddy Rich, but I was also listening to Miles Davis's Live Evo and Coltrane with Farrell Sanders. So th- then people really knew I was crazy. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good crazy, though. You know, you got the jazz bug. Um, so I haven't been so, bored since. <laughs> yeah. So what did you want to be when you grew up? When you were a kid, what did you see yourself being when you grew up? Well, early on, I really loved baseball. I loved baseball statistics. So I saw myself maybe being a sports writer. And then uh, when I saw the movie The Five Pennies, you know, which is a, a Danny Kaye movie that features him playing the role of a trumpeter, Red Nichols, then I wanted to play trumpet. But, you know, I, I've never really figured out how to get a note out of it. So, <laughs> so, so basically, you know, I, and I was, I was an accounting major. Because so, I thought, well, at least I could get a job quickly and not have to go to school more than four years. Yeah. But then j- jazz kind of took me away from that. Well, let me let me kind of stay in your childhood around here and ask you what, like, after you got the bug for Parker and you got Coltrane, you got all these guys. What live music did you see? I mean, what were the real formative jazz shows that you saw? Well, see, this was, uh, you know, first I originally got into jazz in 1970 when I was in still in high school. So, uh, and 19, late 1971 is when I got through. Bebop, and then at that point I started going to concerts. In '72, I remember always remember this: a Hollywood Bowl concert, and it, pro- it probably cost no more than five dollars. Maybe it was even two dollars. And in one 
fairly long day. I got to see Ella Fitzgerald, Count Basie, Stan Getz, Stan Kenton, Cannonball Adderley, and then Oscar Peterson solo piano. Wow. All on the same day. And Oscar Peterson probably stole the show, but all six were pretty amazing. Wow. Um, and this was like 1972. So that was, a, if not my first concert, it was certainly among it. Yeah. So you started writing regularly in 1975. How did that, how did your initial foray into jazz writing happen? Well, it's kind of funny. I, I had a friend who, Brian Ashley, who was, thought it would be a great idea to start a magazine called Record Review and have it be a third classical, a third jazz, and a third rock, you know, just cover all kinds of music. So I started with that, and I was the jazz editor. You know, I started at the top and worked my way down, because I've never been jazz editor since. <laughs> and and so I did that for for about uh, oh, six or seven years until he realized that he was never going to make money from it. But what happened with that magazine is that the classical section eventually got dropped and the rock section became mostly heavy metal. So it became the world's only heavy metal and jazz magazine. <laughs> that's so, funny. So, so, so that, that, that really started me. And, and when I saw that that was going to be ending, I had about a year's notice. I mean, I, I could kind of tell. So I started sending out my reviews to other places, a Cadence I did an awful lot for, and then I sent it to Downbeat. And, and from then on, you know, just any magaz- any jazz magazine that looked good. So your first job as an editor was at Record Review. What was it like to be an editor for the first time? Well, I was practically the only one writing in the jazz section, so <laughs> I, I basically just had to edit myself. And uh, it, it was great because I would have a historic article, you know, this every month, and then I would also interview a couple people. So I interviewed Chick Corea, you know, at that point in time, which was the late seventies, and Maynard Ferguson, Freddie Hubbard, some pretty long review, uh, interviews. And then I, I just basically review whatever I thought was important at the time. Yeah. So since 1975, you saw an, you've seen incredible amounts of not only musicians, but movements and idioms going in and out. What have been some of the biggest changes that you've seen over the years that has transpired in jazz? Well, I think I think it's a, a lack of styles, really. That, you know, it's no, it's no longer individual styles that dominate the music, because you could go through the history of jazz, say, from the say from the early 20s up until about the mid to late 70s, and you could say, well, this this period was the bebop era, and this is when hard bop was big, or this is when the avant-garde or fusion. But since about 1980, there's very few new styles. But then again, you could also say there's an infinite number of new styles. It's just that nobody's dominating the music anymore. So, you know, an awful lot of the music can be considered, say, post-bop, in that it's it's modern, and it, but it's not tied to bebop so much. It's, you know, it's Influenced by the avant garde and fusion, but it's basically beyond words, beyond a, a name. You know, I mean, I don't know what, what kind of music does John Schofield play, or, or even Joe Lovano, or Greg Osby, or people like that. They all play modern jazz. So if someone asks me what what are they playing, I might say that. But you don't have a catchy name anymore, and and it's there isn't one person that's really dominating the scene. It, it's a thousand people, really. Yeah, absolutely. So over the years, you've written for Jazz Times, Downbeat, all kinds of different uh, magazines. What have those experiences been like going from different magazines? Does it all kind of feel the same, or are there distinct flavors in each of those uh, organizations? Well, each one's slightly different. I mean, when you write about jazz, you have to think about what the audience is, or how how much into the music the audience is. I mean, in the case of Downbeat, you know, the audience is... Pr- uh, pretty sophisticated where it might be a little different if you write for a daily paper where they might not have heard of most of the people you're talking about so you have to put in a few sentences to you know explain why this is important and uh, you know but basically uh, they're, all, they're all somewhat similar you I mean i follow similar rules with each one if if someone asks for a 500 word article i'll make sure it's about 450 <laughs> then they're real happy but yeah. if i do 550 they're not happy <laughs> <laughs> and if it's due on a certain day, I'll, I'll try to hand it in about. I'll hand, try to hand it in a few days early, because yeah. no, no one ever complains if you hand in your pieces too early. Oh yeah, oh yeah. So you've written eleven books, eight hundred liner notes for CDs, twenty thousand reviews. I've seen your name all over the place consistently. Tell me what have been some of the best jobs or interview run-ins or brushes with jazz, immortality, things like that. Any good stories you have? Well, I once got to do, uh, well, I once got to ghostwrite line notes for Clint Eastwood. Well, oh, cool. And this is kind of funny. It was for a Horace Silver record, 
uh, one of his Columbia records, and uh, I got a call, and they said, oh, you know, Clint Eastwood's supposed to do line loads, but he doesn't really have time. Would you like to do it? And I said, sure. So I wrote some nice scholarly, fairly lengthy line loads about the history of Horace Silver and talking about the record and everything. And then they called me back and said, no, this isn't quite right. You know, Clint, Clint wouldn't write. You know, Clint doesn't know all that stuff. Why don't you just write something simple? So I, I wrote a, a a paragraph just saying how uh, Horace Silver's my old pal, and I always love his music, and it's great he's coming out with something. And they said it's great. <laughs> that took like five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. So you've also produced some CDs for uh, Allegro Records label. What, what was that like to produce? CDs? Well, it was a fun experience. I mean, I wish it lasted much longer, but basically uh, what I did is I put together reissues. So I I put together about 30, 35 or so of them, and it was it was quite fun because I picked someone like Benny Goodman. Okay, what what selections would I like to put on there from say his prime years? What twenty songs? And it's just it was just like putting together dream sets, really. Yeah. And and I did I did a few obscure people, oh lesser known people. I did a Helen Humes one, uh, Lee Wiley and Harry James, and basically it was really from the thirties up until the about well maybe the twenties up until about the mid fifties that that they had access to all this music. So I put together a couple of sets like the history of the clarinet, you know, during that period of time and the great piano players. And it, it, it was good. You know, I wish I could do a lot more of that because it's putting together records for the collector. So you also had a regular radio show, Jazz After Hours on KCSN. Mm -hmm. What was that like? Did you like radio? Was that something that you really enjoyed? It, it, it was fun. That, I mean, that was a while ago. Basically for three hours a week, I just play whatever I wanted. You know, it was a, a station in Northridge it's still around not not the strongest uh, frequency wise but but I had a, a good audience and what I would do is I would skip between decades I made it a really unique show I mean I might start out with jazz of the Philharmonic in the 50s and then I'd play something from the 20s and I'd play something from the 70s and you know all different styles jumping around yeah. so probably nobody liked everything I played but people had to keep on listening because <laughs> you know you'd have a Big Spiderback followed by Albert Isler, those kind of things. Yeah. And sometimes, you know, I'd have like a topic, the history of, of an instrument or maybe music from 1963, you know, three hours of all kinds of music that happened to be that year. Yeah. Let me ask you this. You're a well-read and well-learned man. Who has taught you the most over your life? When I first started out, you know, I listened. I mean, I, I read, well, Leonard Feather, Nat Hantoff, and Ralph Gleason were the first ones that I really read, and then a little later, Ira Gittler, and I've always thought that Whitney Ballier was probably the best of all the jazz writers, you know, because in his writing, you could actually hear the music, even if you hadn't heard it before, he, just yeah. the way he described it, but, yeah. I, but I, I would never consider myself even close to that level, but but, but basically, I just read everybody, and I I just learn from what they write, and oh, in some cases, what they shouldn't, what, they, what I shouldn't be doing. You know, yeah. I, I, you know, one one thing I learned early on because a few people did this too much is I, I just don't use the word I very much at all, and I'm not yeah. talking about myself in my writing. I'm talking about the music. Yeah, interesting. Because, because with some people, when you're reading their articles, it's like part of their memoirs, and yeah, and no, it, the the stars of the music, musicians, you know, they're the yeah. ones creating the music. The rest of us should just be halfway, halfway invisible, unless it's unless someone really wants me to tell about my memoirs or what I've done. But in most cases, if I'm reviewing a record, it's about the record and about the musicians. Yeah. So speaking of these jazz musicians, who would you consider some of your jazz heroes? Well, Louis Armstrong's my favorite, you know, of all yeah. of them. You know, he's just always a joy to listen to, and he's always creative in his own way. Even if he's playing a solo that we well, you know every note, he's, the phrasing is a little different. And, you know, and it's just such joy in his playing. But but basically, I it, it's hard to say because I, I, you know, I love thousands of them. <laughs> You know, yeah. anything from King Oliver the Coltrane to the people around today. It's, as long as they're creative, you know, that's the main thing. As long as they're they're trying for the main goal of just being themselves in the music. So if you could get into a time machine, go back in time and see a few shows by any musician, any group, at any time, what, what would you want to go see? Well, I definitely would want to see Buddy Bolden because nobody has any idea what he sounded like. So <laughs> any parade or any uh, little uh, – any venue that he was playing at in, say, 1900. I'd love to hear what jazz sounded like at the very beginning. And other than that, the, you know, it, it would be great to hear, well, just getting a little esoteric, like the 1943 Earl Hines Big Band, which a band that never recorded, no no radio broadcast, and yet it had Charlie Parker and Dizzy Gillespie in it two years yeah. before they made their their famous recordings together. Yeah. And so that was like the first bebop orchestra, possibly, but no one knows what they sounded like. 
Yeah. <laughs> And other, other than that, it'd just be great to you know hang out with Fats Waller, you know, or yeah. or, or to see you know dozens and dozens of, of great yeah. uh, events that happened through the history. Yeah. So let me ask you this: Why do you love jazz? Well, I just li- I like the idea of people going on stage and making up music as they d- go along, which to a certain extent, you know, once you get a, beyond the arrangements and the songs and you get to the solos or to the imp- the improvised ensembles. It's, it's just the excitement of it because it's not predictable. The, the very best jazz is, is colorful and innovative and it's full of people taking chances, you know, possibly failing on stage. Yeah. Uh, unlike, say, pop music where they're basically duplicate, quite often duplicating, the, du- doing the best to duplicate their records. In this case, you don't really know what they're going to sound like. So at the end of the day, when you look back on your legacy of, and the prolific work that you put out there, what would you like your legacy in the realm of jazz to be? Oh, you mean how I see myself in the realm? Of- yeah, or how the world of, I mean, your name is on so many things. When people look back over the annals of jazz and see a lot of people get their information from what you've written, what? how do you want to be remembered in the world of jazz? Well, I, I just want to feel that uh, jazz fans uh, got led in the right direction, that they bought records because of me, or they, they discovered artists because I, I wrote something nice about them. Or, uh, you see, one of the keys in, in writing about jazz is not so much writing, not so much saying that I like this person or I don't like this person. It's really giving enough information so the reader will have an idea of whether they'll like it. Yeah. Because there's a lot of stuff I might like where they don't necessarily, so I'll put in a couple of clues there along the way, and they'll have an idea what it might sound like, and they'll know whether they should should uh, pay attention to the artist or not. So I, I guess uh, basically I just want them to think that you know I helped up, uh, help help the music. Everybody's trying to help the music in their own way, and and I would just like to lead people in the right direction, and you know have them uh, increase their record collections, yeah. the stuff they love. So. What's the nicest thing a musician, a jazz musician's ever said to you? I, I guess just I can't can't think of anything really offhand. Just uh, just that. Uh, well, I like it when people when musicians say that I got it. You know, I, well, yeah. you know, you get my music. That's always nice. Yeah. But all, yeah. a lot of times, all you have to really do is listen closely with an open mind. Scott, hey, thank you for taking some time to talk with me today. I'm I'm really happy to, to present you to my audience. Yeah, thanks for interviewing me. It's real, always nice to do. Thanks for listening and tuning in to yet another Neon Jazz interview, where we give you a bit of insight into the finest players in New York, Kansas City, and spots all over the world, giving fans all that jazz. And thanks to Scott for his love of jazz and dedication to the craft. If you want to hear more interviews, go to Famous Interviews with Joe Domino on the iTunes store or visit the neonjazz.blogspot.com for all things neon jazz. Until next time, enjoy the music, my friends. Neon Jazz.